Hey, and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today we're talking to Erica Woodall, an associate professor at the University of Montana in mm -hmm. the Department of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences. There you go. Did I get it all right? Yep. That's very, I'm very proud of myself. And you're studying precision medicine, which right. I've heard a little bit about, but I have only read like, you know, the headline and the first two paragraphs of articles about it. Yeah, it's a pretty cool emerging technology mm -hmm. or thinking about synthesizing, you know, how we are as people. So instead of a one size fits all right. way to diagnose and treat um, diseases, we can figure out, you know, what makes you, you and what makes me, me, and we can tailor medicines you treat me to, specifically. Right. So a lot of it has to do with our genetics, our DNA, but mm -hmm. also things like our diet, um, how much we're outside, how much sun we get. My microflora. Yeah, is it all exactly. about? Exactly, yeah, yeah, the microbiota. And you have to test my poop and then be like, this guy needs this specific kind of Tylenol. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right now we're just <laughs> sticking with blood. <laughs> okay. But yeah, hey, you're good. So precision medicine, we're making uh, do it, making medical decisions and, and developing therapies specifically for individuals. Or is it more sort of like, are we looking at it population-based? Both, really. To understand um, what is so unique about you, we actually need to recruit lots and lots of people into studies mm -hmm. so we can kind of look at patterns. So maybe recruit, you know, a million people or more to try to identify these patterns that you would never see in like 10 people. Mm -hmm. But if we recruit a lot of people into precision medicine studies, then we can learn a lot about what leads to disease or how we can treat disease, and mm -hmm. then that'll help us tailor it to one person. Right. Is there some component of this that's going to be you know, you say, like, get the blood of millions of people. What if the millions of people just send you their spit and you're 23 and me and you have mm -hmm. all this data sitting around? And uh, is there some component of, like, I've, I've done 23 and me. I've, I've, like they've I got my information. To. And there's a, there's a, a time when, uh, when they ask you, like, is it okay for us to, like, give your genetic Share information results. anonymously mm -hmm. to people who are doing this kind of research? Yeah, and, you know, I think the, the power of precision medicine is not just the DNA, but also tying mm. it to health. So tying it to, you know, your electronic medical record, right. tying it to, you know, your Fitbit or, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, how much time you spend out in the sun. Maybe if you live in right. the northern climates like we do. Even conversations with your doctor. Right. Yeah, There's all a, of these things. So that's kind of yeah. more than just the DNA. It's like, how do we right. tie the DNA and change it to the DNA to health and this is always also always something that I've been very interested in because it feels like there's oftentimes we sort of run into these times when we're like, well, we, we can't figure that out. And it's like, well, we should be able to figure this out. We should be able to figure out if people who live within like a certain distance from a coal-fired power plant mm -hmm. have a higher than average chance of asthma or lung cancer or all various things. It's very hard to figure that out because right. we don't have that granularity of data. You know, then you can go deeper than that in statistics and be like, well, if you were raised and you ate fast food for five meals a week, like how, how did that affect how your that affect? eventual outcome? Is, or is that more a matter of like your income when you were growing up? Yeah, all of these things play a role, right? Like you can be genetically predisposed to have a disease, but if you don't have the risk factors that kind of trigger it, mm -hmm. you may never get the disease. So, you know, maybe if you eat a really healthy diet, you'll prevent it. But if you, you know, eat a lot of McDonald's, then you'll get the disease, regardless of your right. genetics. So like 50 years from now, precision medicine, are you talking about that kind of granularity in yeah, the data? Yeah, I, I hope so. I think so. You know, it's not going to be five years, but maybe hopefully less than 20. Maybe that's yeah. optimistic. But yeah, I do think that we're going to have genetic information and we can synthesize it with your electronic medical record and all sorts of different mm -hmm. factors and really do tailor medicines and, and diagnosis. We're still out a little ways, I think. You know, mm -hmm. the cost is still an issue. People are always worried about how right. much genetic tests cost and, and these kind of things. But yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be the future. Should I be worried about my privacy? Yeah. Is, are, are, is like, <laughs> I'm going in for a job and then they're like, they check and they're like, well, that guy's probably going to, he's got like a higher than average risk of mental health problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, those are some ethical challenges with implementation yeah. of precision medicine is that once you've got that information, you know, it's the, you're born with your DNA. So let's say a baby is, uh, they run a genetic test on a baby at birth, right? And then they're healthy and fine, mm -hmm. but then they're 50 and something happens or they're 80 and something happens and you might be able to predict that down the road. So right. these are some of the kind of ethical, legal, social concerns about precision medicine and how do we, you know, kind of mm -hmm. protect privacy and also... Also take care of what, how, uh, how I react to the information that you might found that, find out. Like if you... Yeah. Suddenly it's like, well, can you tell me how I'm going to die? Yeah. It's like, do I want to know that? Like, what's my, what's my death date? Yeah, and it's, so we think about these return of results things with precision medicine. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty focused right now on 
how medicines work, so finding the best medicine for you. But if right. I find out which medicine works for you, I might also find out your risk for Parkinson's or mm -hmm. cancer or you know whatever kind of incidental findings. Right. So then it becomes, you know, do you want to know that? And that's a very personal choice. I think some yeah. people, I would want to know everything. I want to know mm -hmm. like all of my genetics, but you know, I'm a geneticist, <laughs> so I would like to know everything, but some people just really don't. They don't want to know anything. They don't want to know what's right. in the future. Well, yeah, I'd like so 23andMe, when you get your data that you can get your sort of like bulk information yeah. and put it into different websites right. that will tell you like, do you have any of these risk factors? And yeah. I pun punched it in and I was like, I was like below average on everything. <laughs> well, that's good. I was like, every, everything's coming up bad for me. Oh, bad? bad oh, yeah, I thought you meant below, like, below average risk. No, oh, no, okay. above average risk. Yeah, yeah. Sorry and I'm like, oh, that. geez. <laughs> like, and I was like, things that I had never worried about before suddenly mm -hmm. I was worrying about. I know, it doesn't, you know, and then is that going to change your no, behavior? Yeah, exactly. Not. It's going to make me feel a little nervous for about four hours, and yeah, then I'll and then fall asleep away. and wake up the next morning and have breakfast. <laughs> so thank you for doing a great job of explaining and uh, delving into some of the very surface level, <laughs> level thoughts about precision medicine. But I also sure. want to know, like, what do you do? Like, what's, what's your research? Yeah, so my research, for the past 11 years, uh, we've been working with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes mm. on the Flathead Reservation to understand how precision medicine can be used in American Indian and Alaska Native communities, too. Um, so we're really curious because uh, up until our research, there was virtually nothing known hmm. about pharmacogenetics, um, which is, pharmacogenetics is a part of precision medicine, so it's really specific to drug response um, that okay. can be characterized by genetics. So okay. it's the pharma genetics, pharmacogenetics. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no data. So if we think about implementing pharmacogenetic testing to improve drug prescribing, we actually had no data on American Indian people mm. to even be able to say, well, if we have these tests available, will they even be applicable for this population? Right. We know nothing about the unique, perhaps the unique genetic variation there. Mm -hmm. When you're doing this, what what drugs are you most concerned about? What diseases are you most concerned about? Like, what are the kinds of therapies that are more dependent on genetics? So most of my research is on using genetics to improve drug prescribing, and really any therapeutic category wow. can be has the potential to be improved through pharmacogenomics. Um, the field sort of started in oncology, so a lot of cancer medications have mm -hmm. genetic predictions for choosing the right drug for the person, um, but cardiovascular disease is really increasing, um, immunotherapy, mental health. There's a lot of therapeutic applications. Mm -hmm. um, the work that we've been doing with the Tribal Health Department on the Flathead, initially they were really interested in cancer medications. So a lot of our early work was to identify what are some of the unique genetic mm -hmm. variation that could predict um, who may respond the best to certain um, anti-cancer medications. Right. And now we're moving into cardiovascular. So we're starting to look into cardiovascular diseases and medications that could be used to decrease the likelihood of a clot. And this is so interesting to me because it highlights how complicated disease is. Mm -hmm. You know, I've started to be able to internalize the fact that cancer is not one disease. It is kind of a different disease for every person who has it sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and often, like, what you're finding is that they're, like, the way that it's behaving in an individual has to do with one particular mutation or a series of risk factors and 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 a cure or a treatment mm -hmm. probably is a better word for than cure yeah a treatment for that uh would be aimed at one particular cause of of that you know overgrowth of cells yeah and uh and and if that's not the thing that's causing it it's not going to help that much right and but but then that that can also apply to a clotting disorder, which to me, it just seems like, oh, this is just something that happens as you get older, but it's yeah. it's not. It's like it's a cause of a breakdown of a system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people are predisposed to, you know, having cardiovascular disease. You know, you hear a lot like, oh, my I had my dad mm -hmm. died really young of a heart attack, you know, and then you then their offspring might be also predisposed to heart disease. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of diseases have um, a genetic uh, predisposition, but of course, like we talked about, it's environmental too. So just mm -hmm. because you have a genetic risk factor doesn't mean you will acquire the disease. It's sort of, you know, thinking about the multifactorial um, yeah. genes, you, environment, and, and You're multiplying else. different probabilities together. Right. And at the end of that, you still get a probability. Right. And so even yeah, if you have all of the certainty. things, you might be just fine. Yeah. And if you have none of them, then you also still might not be just fine. Right. Where does this end? Do, like, I go in, 
do I start, do I get the drug test first before I even have any disease? And so people will know better yeah. what I'm predisposed to and how to treat it when it comes up? I think so, yeah. I think that that's the way that pharmacogenetics and precision medicine is really going to work, to have it before we actually start prescribing. Because when a patient comes into the doctor's office, right, they write the prescription right then. And mm -hmm. so it'd be useful to have that genetic information right there in the electronic medical record when mm -hmm. the doctor's choosing the medicine. So, you know, I think that the only way it's really going to work is... Um, kind of a priori genetic testing so it's there when medical wow. decisions are being made. But then that does mean we're going to, someone's going to have to pay for preemptive genotyping, and that's kind of one of the challenges now. What's the value proposition? How do you get, how do you get that paid for? I mean, one, you make it cheaper. Right. Is that, and I, that's that happening every happened. day. Yeah. 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 But it, you know, it has to go down another order of magnitude or, or two mm -hmm. before it's like super cheap. Um, it's always been very interesting to me. I mean, the American medical system was a complicated thing that we're probably not going to fix right now at right. the SciShow talk show. <laughs> uh, but it's always been very interesting to me. If you find ways of lowering the cost of healthcare, someone should be there to pay for that. Right. Because if, it, if like one thing is going to lower the eventual cost, then we should pay for the one thing. Right. And I feel like there are cases where we just end up not doing that because there's no one there to do that. Yeah, no one there to decide that this is useful. And the interesting thing that I always think about with genetic testing is that it's one time, right? Like you mm -hmm. get your genetic tests, um, once, and then you have that information forever. Where we think about other things that we go to the doctor for routinely, right? They're always checking our glucose and mm -hmm. our cholesterol, like every single time we go, or you know, most of the time we go mm -hmm. to the doctor. So those are costs that are potentially every doctor's visit. Um, whereas this is a one-time cost. Right. It is preemptive, but it is you know for the potentially for the life of the patient. Unless we start to think we need to test for epigenetics as well. That's and true. Like methylations can change over your life. Yeah, and, and that like you know <laughs> blows everything out about what we know about genetics, right? I mean, yeah. that's, we're just at the very surface of what we know about epigenetics and how that uh, ties to health is. You know, yeah. it's going to be really exciting. Totally. Yeah. Oh man, it's it's very exciting when we you know talk about a cure for these diseases that kill so many people and that mm -hmm. are sort of like uh, oftentimes though not always diseases of old age in my head I've always just sort of been like yeah well, well we talk about curing cancer but we're not going to cure cancer is this is this a path through which we actually find a way where people won't die of cancer anymore oh I, I don't know that's that's a that's a difficult question because you know we've like we talked about cancer is so complex, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that the, I hope that the goal of precision medicine will sort of improve responses. You know, right now we sort of throw a drug at a patient and it may or may not work. So I hope that kind of implementing some of these things will get the patient on the, the right medicine for them sooner so that the drug works better mm -hmm. and hopefully avoid some, you know, really sometimes serious side effects too. Right. You know, I don't know if it's, it's not going to be the thing that cures all diseases, right? But it's going to be another tool. <laughs> I just want to cure all diseases. I know. Is that I work too on much it. to ask? Yeah. That, that'll be my next thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very exciting. Are there any implementable like findings that you've had for American With Indian my specific and, research? and Native Alaskan populations? Yes. Yeah, so we recently um, published a study looking at tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a drug that's used for women with estrogen-positive breast cancer, and it's been used for probably nearly 40 years. So mm -hmm. it's a very good drug, and it's very, very effective. But we know that there's certain women who their cancer still comes back um, after a course of tamoxifen. And so we um, conducted a study here on the Flathead and then with collaborators in Alaska looking at how American Indian Alaska Native women might respond to tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. So we recruited women into the study. Um, they gave a blood sample where we looked at their DNA, and then we also looked at the levels of the blood of the drug circulating mm -hmm. in the blood. So we actually found that um, there are certain women about almost 10% of Salish Kootenai uh, women who really should not be hmm. taking tamoxifen and they'd be better off having an alternative medication. So, I mean, that's kind of good news. 90% of the population will do well on a mm -hmm. standard treatment of tamoxifen, but for those 10% of women, uh, we should be thinking about yeah. an alternative medication so that uh, we have more effective cancer treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a, a pretty cool study. And mm -hmm. I've always been interested in the tamoxifen story. It was kind of like one of my babies. So. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, it's so interesting that precision medicine really does highlight how when we are developing a drug, we sort of treat everyone as equal. Mm -hmm. We say like, we, we developed this drug in America. Right. And we have test subjects that are the people who end up in medical tests who are often probably people who are fighting extra hard or who are going to the nicest cancer clinics and, right. and so they might not be 
completely in line with the overall population with of everybody. this country, right. certainly not of all countries. Yeah. And uh, and you end up in a in a world where maybe like the dr- the drug that we've been relying on forever might not work as well in another country. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. It doesn't it, like that's not intuitive until until like it is. Like this kind of work. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's, I think it's really interesting too, and not, you know, and like drug development, but that also once the drug is on the market and we start thinking about genetic testing, right? It's like a lot of this pharmacogenetic testing and precision medicine is really centered at this moment in large academic medical centers in urban centers. Mm-hmm. So that's great. But what about those of us that don't live very close to an urban yeah. academic medical center? So how do we think about the challenges of implementing this kind of genomic technology in places like Montana or other mm-hmm. more rural states. Yeah, and you you might also end up with a system where, like, side effects can be genetically based, too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, a, a medicine that might work very well and have not as many side effects for one population might have side effects for other populations. Yeah. And so you need these sort of, like, again, like a huge amount of data to be specific to one person. Yeah. Which is fascinating. Are there plans and ways to get access to that huge amount of data? Yeah, so there is. So um, a few years ago, um, that was launched the Precision Medicine Initiative, which has now been recoined to all of us. Mm-hmm. And so the goal is to recruit, I think it's a million participants in the U.S. from all over um, the country to understand what are sort of the, what would be, you know, if you had a million people, mm-hmm. this is hopefully hopefully more re- representative of the country as a whole. So that initiative is just starting. I think they're just recruiting participants now. But the challenges are, again, is that a lot of the recruitment sites are Um, in big cities. Mm -hmm. So I think the only recruitment site in the West is in California, and there's also one in Arizona. So, you know, we have kind of a ways to go even with the all of us to make sure it's really all of us. All of us, yeah. (laughs) All right. That is fascinating and so cool. Thank you for doing all that work. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's meet somebody. Jesse, where are you? Hey, Jesse. Now, immediately, (laughs) we will see that there's a a cavi on the table, but maybe not immediately we'll notice that there's also a beaver on your left. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I wanted to bring two because this is oh. such an interesting topic today about yeah, individuals and um, variation. How, mm-hmm. Yeah, and how medicine t- or treatment and care can differ for animals that animals that seem very similar. Mm-hmm. And these guys are both rodents. Is this a cavi skull? That is a Patagonian cavi skull. So that is the skull that would be in that is inside of him. Yeah. And uh, this is a, a beaver skull, and you can see they're both rodents. They have those awesome teeth, mm-hmm. and uh, most rodents eat similar types oh, of sucks. food. And just careful, he doesn't like strangers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so he'll he'll hide back here. Are oh, all nobody. beavers that chubby? Yes, they are. <laughs> He's, He's actually well not even full grown yet. Oh no! I know, buddy. So even though they are both rodents and they have very similar teeth, and their digestive systems are, are quite similar as well, um, they're both herbivores, and so they eat a lot of plant material. And then have to figure out how to digest all that <laughs> and then they plant have, material. Yeah, so they have a huge cecum, and that's going to help them, you know, break all the cellulose apart. But they also digest things differently as well. So. Cavies, so guinea pigs and and Patagonian cavies, maras, um, and capybaras, they all have to do coprophagia, which is they eat Mm. their own feces. So they're Mm. going to digest it, and then they're going to eat it and do a second pass. A second pass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then these guys, they do not do that. And they're like, after the second pass comes out, they're like, ew, that's poop. But the first poop is like, yeah. (laughs) Delicious. The delicious stuff. (laughs) So that's food poop and poop poop. (laughs) Exactly. Can you tell the difference? Can I tell the difference between Between the food poop and the the poop poop? Well, one's going to be a little bit drier. Okay. um, And is going to look a little bit more digested. It's really obvious in an animal that's not a rodent, the rabbit. The rabbit is a really easy one to tell. because it gets kind of slimy, but mm. cavies, it's not quite as slimy. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, I'm chili glad pepper, I look how good he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you, <laughs> you're glad you asked about the poop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've always wondered. I, I, I know about that exclusively because of Watership Down. Hey, buddy. I love that book. <laughs> I love that book. Hey, buddy, do you want to say here? Come on over here. Do you want to say hey? Do you want to show everybody your big hey. beaver body? There you go. Your big, beautiful beaver body? Do you want to eat it's your so food? Big. Oh my God. Oh, no. They're oh, so. Big. Yeah. What's, yeah. What's in there? What's in where? All that big beaver body. Um, well, a lot of it is fur. So he's got about an inch of fur on either side. Uh-huh. And then, he's also real squished up. Yeah, he is he kind of like in a her. ball right now. And so if you saw him swimming in the water, he would just kind of look 
longer. Thick, you yeah. know, like a like a, a he's not like as skinny as him, right. um, but he also can run thirty five miles an hour. Wow, right. uh, beavers really beavers beaver. don't really run; they kind of like wobble. Yeah. <laughs> um, about right. and, but so, like, think of a penguin. Like, yeah. they are super uncoordinated yeah. on land, but then they get in the water and they're just, like, majestic. And so also, same with like, these you guys. need, because beavers live in the cold, and so they need to be, they, they need, need to be blubbery. They blubber-y. need to have that, they don't have quite have blubber, but they do have a nice layer of, <laughs> of fat there. And then they store a ton of fat in their tail. Yeah, that tail. To help them out. Huge. There you go, bud. Yeah. What do you think? Do you want any of these other things? What about? What about corn? Do you want corn? I'm afraid of corn. <laughs> Temporarily, he's afraid like, of no, corn. I do want the yam, though. I decided. Still that oh, I had yam offer. in my mouth. I forgot that there was yam in my mouth. <laughs> I think he did forget that there was yam in his mouth. Good job, Chili Pepper. I know you're getting lots of food from Taylor. She's being very good to you. And there I, you yeah, go. and it seems like Huckleberry is getting more comfortable. He is. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good job, buddy. What a big giant beaver. <laughs> he's huge. Yeah, your pee smells. Oh, it does. It yeah, smells. It's what do you think it smells like? Uh, I don't know. It's like a little. Sour? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it smells swampy. Mm-hmm. Like a fish swamp water. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I, I, you know what it smells like to me is like pee, but more. <laughs> yeah, good description. <laughs> it is pee like. It's pee, but more. Yeah. It smells bad in here. <laughs> That's a good way of saying that. Yeah. All right, so besides like how they digest, taking care of these guys, they're going to eat a lot of different kinds of food. He actually has to eat wood um, and leaves and he's not he does eat the wood a little bit but it's mostly that like the cambium layer under there that right. nice mm. green stuff that you see mm-hmm. um, that's his fate do you want some do you want some corn what do you think corn so my good. finger there you go <laughs> yeah i imagine like don't get bit by a beaver right yeah yeah, they have like, incredible. I mean, show off their teeth. They have incredible well, they can teeth. Bite trees down. Yeah, if yes, you can bite they can. a tree down. <laughs> Your fingers. Are Be bad. careful. <laughs> Your artery <laughs> is vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if either of these guys got sick, um, the way that we would take care of them is quite different. Even though they they digest similarly, besides the um, cecotrophs. So um, these guys, you would have to give them what we would call like poop slurries um, to get their, their digestive tract back on. Um, and you could just syringe it into You're their gonna mouth. You're going to have to tell me what a poop slurry is. You can't well, just say poop slurry. What do it's you like think it would be? We talked about. <laughs> yeah, is it, is it like a fecal transplant? Or is it it just is. Like, well, but not like, but it's just, they, they, it's not a tube that goes down right. like with just, us. They, they would just eat, eat it. it. Yeah. It, yeah. So you you like could mix, put like a little like bit of like applesauce with it or something. Um, but if they're not digesting the applesauce, then yeah, it'd just be just be poop in water. <laughs> their own poop. Um, not no, because if they if they don't have their bacteria good, then um, it, that's well, not going to help. Yeah. Exactly. Poop. So it's yeah. going to have to be someone else's poop. Ideally, they're fa- a family member. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting would they, is would they these do guys. They do that in the wild too. Would they be like, "Hey, I'm not feeling very good, yes. Susan. Can, can I poop? have can some? Can I have some? <laughs> Please, Susan. Can I have some poop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. They would eat each other's. Um, and the babies actually, to get started, they'll eat their mother's poop. Um, so that's a pretty common occurrence. These guys, uh, they will eat their mother's poop in the very beginning, but then they don't after that. Um, but the interesting thing about these guys, so we rescued Huckleberry. He was very, very young, um, about three weeks old, and um, he was extremely dehydrated. And uh, the thing about these guys is you can't give them like sub-Q fluids. So if he was dehydrated, we could just put a, a little needle in and have a drip and um, put some sub-Q Just in between fluids. his skin and uh, Right underneath his skin and above his muscle, yeah. Um, and Why just fill it up. Why can't you do it for the beaver? They, have, they do Too not thin. have very much space between their skin and their muscle oh. and so it's very they're like i can't Sorry. i can't like i can't do this like mm. that mm. um and so when you were trying to put in there they wouldn't absorb it very well there's not much space um and so it's not it's not an effective way to treat these How guys you rehydrate a beaver you have to give them they have to eat they have to participate oh. hmm. yeah you can't give them like a beaver iv no, I mean you, you could, could if you could. knock them out and take <laughs> them to yes, the hospital exactly, and, yeah. which would be super stressful um so yeah, so when he w- he had to actively 
eat the the liquefied food that we were giving him. So yeah, so he luckily he was he was all for it. it. And uh, he got healthy and, and grew and won't stop and growing, grew grew which grew. is a good so thing. So how much bigger body. will he get? Um, these guys can get between, about 70 pounds, 60 to 70 pounds. Wow. And oh he's God, about really um, between 35 and 40. I haven't wow. weighed him in the last month. so Half mm -hmm. size. Uh, exactly. So they get to be about three feet long when they're wow. full grown. So like... I mean, the biggest, biggest ones. Yeah. I gotta tell well, I you, big. Jesse. Yeah. No one understands how big beavers are. <laughs> they really don't. They don't. When he was even smaller than this, they're like, it's just a beaver. I'm like, no, no, no. This, this is, is a, a baby, baby beaver. beaver. <laughs> um, I just feel like I will not be able to accept how big a beaver is until I see Huckleberry at full size. Oh, buddy, you so booked another gig. <laughs> yeah. You booked another gig. I mean, I'm, I'm worried. I don't know how you're going to get him in there. Like, how are you going to get him through the door? I mean, he's not going to be too big to fit through a door, but I mean, we're going to have to upgrade his crate. I bet. And I'm probably going to have to put wheels on it because... Yeah, you can't yeah. pick up a 70-pound crate. <sighs> yeah. 70 pound beaver with like, it's like a 15 pound crate. So that's like yeah. hauling 85 pounds around. Like, wow. I mean, some people can, but I don't want to. That's great. Uh -oh. well, I'm so glad that you found a good <laughs> Do house. Do you want to feed him here? Sure. Oops, I sorry. can feed him. Hold that and he'll take a bite of it. Hold it really tight. Oh, he's going to eat all the he's crumbs first. Oh. Yeah, get a very little last morsel. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, even though they have the same teeth, it? these guys tend to, they'll take a bite of oh, it okay. and then like a big bite and then crunch it oh, down. Oh, nice. These guys will take many tiny little bites, bite so, nee, 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 mm. which is just kind of indicative of, it's funny those, because he has huge teeth. got those teeth. big molars, yeah. Yeah, but um, he's going to be taking little tiny pieces to get through a large item where he's going to like bite off some grass and then chew it. Okay. I have something to tell everybody at home, which is that Jesse told me I had to hold these skulls the whole time because otherwise Chili Pepper would eat them. <laughs> Really? <laughs> he, would, I, he would chew on them, and he could possibly break them. Well, he, I imagine. Did they yes. just eat anything? Crunch, crunch, he's crunch. Just curious. He's, he's not going to eat those, oh, like their food. Not he's, it. he's just a very curious guy, yeah, and he crunch. explores things with his mouth, and he just destroys a lot of things. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chili Pepper wants to feel the crunch. He likes it. Look at him crunching <laughs> now. It's like all yep. of us in our it's Doritos, going, except that like, like a Dorito is nothing. A Dorito is basically mushy to a rodent. <laughs> The first initial crush crunch would be a good crunch. Yeah, it'd be it. a good crunch. I don't know. Not com yeah. not compared with a tree. <laughs> it's true. Just nothing. True. It's like a piece of paper. <laughs> Huck, I'm so happy that you're doing so well. Oh, I love this so happy good. happy beaver. <laughs> He's so happy. Yeah, I mean, because you were so <laughs> sad and little when you first showed up. So this is he was. He was. He was itty bitty, and he was pretty sick. And uh, man, he is. He is just doing fine. Now. Overcome the odds. <laughs> Look at you, buddy. <laughs> Pet, pet. All right, Huck, thanks for coming in. Chili Pepper, thank you. Jesse is available all over YouTube, <laughs> uh, youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana, and as the host of SciShow Kids, where you can find Woo. Jesse doing lots Have of cool stuff. Have some more stuff. fur. Yeah. We've, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we've got lint rollers. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank Erica, you. as well, it was a fascinating conversation. Yeah, I just want to keep great. having it. Um, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for watching. If you want to get smart about stuff, that's what SciShow's for. <laughs> <laughs>